So this is Elmo, and normally I would chew him away, but he is about a thousand years old and about 14 hours away from death, probably. So I'm trying to be nice to him and just let him go where he wants. Well, we're up to screencast two, and last time we started building this aggregate demand, aggregate supply model. Um, this time we're going to focus on aggregate supply, which is probably not a surprise to anybody. So let's define what aggregate supply is. It's the amount of real output, again, another way of saying GDP, that businesses, firms, will produce at every possible level of prices. So like aggregate demand, it's a series of what-if statements. If inflation is a certain level, if price levels are a certain level, how much will businesses produce? If inflation changes, if price level changes, um, what happens to that level of production? <clears throat> Here's what aggregate supply is going to look like, and uh, it's got kind of a weird shape. Unlike aggregate demand, it doesn't look exactly like um, its counterpart in microeconomics. Um, you'll notice that the axes are the same as the aggregate demand curve, and we're going to wind up combining both curves. Um, but today is mostly about this weird shape of the aggregate supply curve and figuring out why it has this shape. First off, you'll notice that basically aggregate supply is upward sloping, kind of like supply in microeconomics, um, for very similar reasons. Higher price levels provide an incentive to produce more. If in the micro level you're selling lemonade and you're selling uh, it for one penny a cup, you'll make a certain amount of lemonade. But if you could sell it for $100 a cup, you'd start making a lot of, uh, of lemonade. And the same is true here, um, but now again we're talking about aggregate supply, total supply, so we're talking about all the producers in the economy and all the stuff that they'll make. I'm so sorry that I just hit you in the face. All right, so to understand why aggregate supply has this weird shape, we have to add one line into the graph that you just saw for aggregate supply. Here's our, what aggregate supply looks like, and there's a very, very special place in this graph, a magical place in this graph. And that place is happening right here. Now follow that dotted line down till it hits the x-axis. That's our GDP axis, right? This is a very special level of GDP. It's what we called in the last unit full employment GDP. Again, you could think of that as what we want GDP to be, what GDP would be if we had full employment, right? If we're at that natural rate of unemployment. Think of this as the amount of stuff we'd make if we had unemployment levels that were basically perfect for our economy. Now remember, full employment doesn't mean every single person's working, right? We're always having structural uh, unemployment, we're always going to have frictional unemployment, so we're always going to have around 5-6% unemployment. We, we call that natural rate of unemployment, right? But it, at this level of GDP, there's none of the bad kind of unemployment, none of that cyclical unemployment, the unemployment that happens when the economy is tanking, that when we're in a recession. Um, so everything else on the aggregate supply curve is kind of in relation to this one magical point in the graph. Now a little bit later on, just so you get a little foreshadowing, um, we're going to call this line something. We're going to call it long run aggregate supply. And I'll let you just think about what that might mean. Um, but think of the green line, the one that we're looking at now, is short run aggregate supply. And sometimes just called aggregate supply because, you know, we're almost always in the short run. All right, now if you look closely at the, at the curve, there are three distinct ranges here. There's a horizontal range, an upward sloping uh, range, and then a vertical range. And again, if you could relate all these ranges to that perfect spot in the graph, they start to make sense. <clears throat> start with the horizontal range. Notice that this is at very, very low levels of GDP and low levels of employment. Right, We're far away from that full employment GDP level. That's what a recession looks like in this graph, if we're anywhere down there, right? Low GDP, we're not making much stuff, we're not satisfying many human wants and needs, we have lots of unemployment. Remember, moving left in the graph means lots of unemployment. So that's what a recession looks like. And down in this range, the idea is that producers can produce more. Let's say we're starting on the left-hand side of the graph and we're working our way over. Producers can start producing more without raising prices because there are so many unemployed resources in the economy. There's lots of workers without work. There's lots of steel that's not being used. So we could use more of it without those resource prices rising. And as a result, producers don't have to charge higher prices to cover those costs. 
And furthermore, producers are reluctant to raise prices for lots of reasons. You can see them on the screen. Uh, sometimes they have wage contracts that they can't break, and so their costs stay the same even in a recession. Sometimes lowering wages uh, or paying people less can hurt morale, and they want to avoid that. There are minimum wage laws um, that prevent them from lowering resource costs um, below a certain amount. Um, there are what are called menu costs, which come from restaurants, the actual cost of changing prices. If you're a restaurant and you have to change the prices on your menu, you have to reprint your menus, and that's actual, actually a cost that businesses try to avoid. And then finally, fear of price wars. So there's all sorts of reasons why when the economy is doing really badly, when we're in a low recession and we have lots of unemployed resources, producing more or moving to the right in the graph means that resource prices won't necessarily rise initially, and as a result, prices don't rise. Now in the intermediate range, and by the way, this is where we are 99% of the time, you know, some, we're somewhere near full employment. We're not in that deep, deep recession uh, slash depression that the horizontal range represents. Um, and for that reason, a lot of times in graphs, you'll only see aggregate supply as an upward sloping line because they're gonna be ignoring the two extreme parts. Anyway, in this range, you'll notice in the graph that we're approaching full employment which means that getting resources is gonna become more expensive for businesses. If I need more workers, they're not just lying around on the street waiting for jobs. Like I might actually have to go to someone who already has a job and offer to pay them more to entice them to come work for me. So when resource prices rise, as we're nearing full employment and using more of our steel and more of our workers and et cetera, that's where we start to see inflation happening. Producers start raising their price to cover those increased costs. And again, um, remember that this is where we are most of the time, so don't get thrown off if you see a graph that just has the upward sloping part of the aggregate supply curve. Now, if that dotted line represents full employment GDP, you might wonder how we can possibly be past that. Now, the answer is it is possible to move past full employment GDP. Remember, that's still like 5% unemployment. There's still a lot of people who aren't even in the labor force, right? Retired people, etc. So you might imagine that I, as dictator of the universe or dictator of the country, got a whip. And I just started whipping everyone to work as hard as they could for every waking hour that they could possibly be awake. Not only the people that are working, I go into like the nursing homes and I get out the old people and I start making them work. And I go into like nurseries and get babies and I put them on gerbil wheels so that they can generate electricity and I just make them keep crawling and whipping them as they crawl. Right? And imagine I did that for everyone in the entire country and made everyone work as hard as they possibly could. Right? We can get past what's normally considered to be full employment. But the idea is that it's relatively unsustainable. Right? You can't keep that up forever. Now, in actuality, the way we can get past full employment is through more reasonable things like overtime or trying to increase the labor force, um, extending the work week from 40 hours to 50 hours or forcing workers to take second jobs. Um, but again, those are all kind of temporary things that can't really be kept up forever. So in the vertical range, think of that as the economy's absolute capacity to produce stuff. It simply cannot produce one more thing because everyone's already working as hard as they possibly can, even the people that don't want to work. All right, so now that we got the basic shape of the curve, let's talk about what could move it, because as you were probably expecting, supply curves move just like demand curves. Remember that supply is about making stuff. Demand was about buying stuff. So if for any reason producers want to produce more or less, this supply curve is going to move. More is going to be a move to the right, and less is to the left. Here's what a move to the right looks like. If producers start to decide to produce more, at every possible price level, the quantity of GDP of output stuff produced is gonna go up. Just like everything else, if there's less, aggregate supply can also shift this time to the left. And here's what a shift to the left looks like. Again, focus on the upward sloping part of the curve because that's the part that'll look most familiar to you and it's the part you're gonna see most of the time. Aggregate supply shifting to the left, shifting to the left. So finally, just like demand, you need to know what's going to move these curves. Um, and this you haven't really seen before in the last unit, but
but it's stuff that should seem familiar to you from microeconomics. Aggregate supply is about making stuff. So generally, if it's easier, cheaper to make stuff, more aggregate supply is going to shift to the right. Harder, more expensive to make stuff, less aggregate supply, shift to the left. So the first determinant, resource prices. Prices of things like workers, land, raw materials, that kind of stuff. If resource prices go down, easier to make stuff. AS shifts right. Opposite if resource prices go up. Second component, productivity. How awesome your resources are. You can lump in technology into this category. If you got awesome new robots, awesome new technologies, that obviously changes how easy or hard it is to make stuff. So if productivity increases, if your workers become more awesome, you've trained them better, they have more education, more aggregate supply. If your resources get worse, less aggregate supply, shift to the left. And then finally, and this is something that Republicans and conservatives tend to focus on a lot, the legal and institutional environment. What world businesses have to inhabit based on the rules and regulations of government. So this is things like taxes, business taxes, environmental laws, basically anything that makes it harder, even if you approve of those things and you want them for society. Um, you have to concede that those things do make it harder to produce or more expensive to produce. So if business taxes go up, I'm looking at the right side of your screen now, if business taxes go up, if um, businesses were getting subsidies like ethanol is getting subsidies and they lose those subsidies from the government, or if the government um, imposes costly regulations like environmental laws, uh, worker safety laws, that makes it harder, more expensive to produce and aggregate supply shifts left. Um, aggregate supply will shift right if you make it easier for, for businesses, cut their taxes, give them subsidies perhaps, um, remove costly regulations. All right, so I hope the view of me stroking my cat for however many minutes straight wasn't too disturbing, and I will see you next time. This is Annie here on the top. And Annie is three months old. And do you keep them separate? They, they probably <laughs> yes, could. Yes. But the problem is we don't get very many uh, three things. Babies. Yeah, they're the two we have. Back. Yeah. They're, they're just much.